I want to jump to 1978. Malachi Martin, a Jesuit. 78 or 68? Uh, 1978. Okay, 1978, gotcha. We left off with uh, the term the New World Order, and we're jumping ahead to 1978 because there's going to be a change in popes, as we know, as we approach 1979. In 1978, Malachi Martin, a Jesuit priest, wrote the book, The Final Conclave, or if you translate it, The Selection of the Final Pope. He was considered the ultimate insider in the Vatican. He was a close personal friend of Pope John the 23rd. He taught six years at Vatican University. But Martin revealed that there was an internal struggle within the Vatican on whether or not the next pope should be a communist from a communist nation. And there was a struggle because typically the popes were of Italian descent from Italy. And Martin was of the opinion, very telling here, because this had not yet transpired. It would transpire in the next two years. Martin was of the opinion that the next pope, if he were a communist, that communism would capture the church, and then communism would gain control of not only the church, but the world. And by the way, that's from a WBBM radio broadcast in 1978, where, these are, where they interviewed him in his book. And was, then was, was he still involved in the Vatican, Malachi Martin? Because I, I know he, if I, at, if I remember right, did he come out? Uh, yeah, I think he did, and I'm not sure the timing of that for him to say this. And then the the political system, then the communist communist system would destroy the church. So let's look at this piece by piece. Martin was of the opinion that if communism captured the church then they would gain control of the world and then turn and destroy the church. Well, guess what? That's exactly what Bible prophecy says will happen. There'll be a political, a, a political entity that will, worldwide that will affiliate and be supported by this apostate church, one world religion, promoted by the false prophet, and then that political entity will turn on the very system that promoted it. It'll turn on the, the apostate religion. Uh, in 1978, Pope Paul VI died, and that takes us into 1979. That's why we started here for the next pope. And it, uh, Pope John Paul I uh, was elected. And as far as I know, he was not a communist, nor did he he was only in office 33 short days. One, he was considered in relatively good health at 65 years old. And he immediately wanted to rid the Vatican of, um, for lack of a better term, corruption. And he had ordered key investigations into the financial dealings of the Vatican and other questionable policies and relationships of the Vatican. In particular, there was a gentleman by the name of Paul Marcinkus that was the Vatican's banker, and he was relieved and under investigation to the point where within the Vatican walls he had protection, but it was said outside the Vatican walls, of course, he was not free from arrest. Cardinal Cody in Chicago. Chicago keeps coming up. Have you noticed that? It is interesting, isn't it? Cardinal Cody was under, and I don't remember if he was actually suspended or under investigate, only under investigation for over a million dollars of church money was finding its way to a woman in Florida. And it was determined that this woman was a, a quote unquote, a friend of Cardinal Cody. Well, that very night when he instituted these things, he mysteriously died. And uh, none of his 
decrees regarding these investigations saw the light of day. It was Malachi Martin that wrote a follow-up book entitled Vatican that claimed in it that Pope John Paul I was indeed assassinated. On Irvin Baxter's media program, Politics and Religion, Mr. Baxter asked him, Mr. Martin, directly, was the Pope assassinated? And Mr. Martin answered that to those who worked inside the inner workings of the Vatican, that there was no doubt that Pope John Paul I had been assassinated. Now other books that suggest that include Pontiff by Gordon Thomas and Max Morgan Witt, and in God's name by David Yellop. Although Martin is very specific and he also said that under, uh, under direct questioning. So that he, we don't know in terms of his, other than the fact that he wanted to eliminate corruption, uh, whether he would have favored socialism as well. But it is clear that shortly thereafter, we now know in 1979 following Pope John the first that Pope John Paul II uh, will be uh, confirmed as the next pope. He's the first pope ever elected from a communist country. So now that question and concern that, that Ma uh, Martin had, Malachi Martin had, about a communist being elected and the, the fact that potentially... Uh, a political system would get a hold of the church. That now has come to pass. And Pope John Paul II is the youngest elected in 154 years. Of course, he oversaw the Catholic Church in Communist Poland. And in Poland, the church actually did well in terms under, commun under a communist dictatorship of actually thriving under an alliance with communist rule. And he was the first non-Italian pope in 455 years to be elected. Now, it was reported that Pope John Paul II, during, while he was waiting to see if he was going to be elected, while the votes were being counted in the conclave, he read the World Marxist Review, which is the official publication of international communism. Then he went to the UN in the first year of his rule and called for massive wealth redistribution. Remember that's the number one plank of right. international communism. In 1979, under Pope John Paul II, and this is revealed on page 560 of Martin's book, Vatican, Pope John Paul quote said, that it was, he was determined to, quote, show the Soviets how to make socialism work via religion. He continued to say, I plan to deal with the Soviets not by announcing that we will bury them, but by showing them how to solve the problem that they themselves know will bury them. In other words, we know that communism in Russia and other countries uh, was failing. And the Pope proposed to show how an alliance with religion uh, could make communism work. And again, he favored massive wealth redistribution. Now, is Malachi Martin, is he still living? That I'm not sure it, of. That'd be I, I was wondering, you know, if, he was, if anyone tried to assassinate him. We'll have to make a note of that to follow up on that. That'd be interesting to know. Uh, Pope John Paul continues, I plan to give them a model where religion, morality, and social culture are totally detached and independent from political control. And then one of the Pope's aides asked the Pope if Poland was to be the model. The Pope nodded and said, but more than a model for the Soviets, we will also have produced a model for Europe. So Poland then was to be the model used to show how to solve the problems for socialism through the lens of an organized religious structure. This would produce a model for all of Europe in which the state and Catholicism could work through 
perfected socialism. And that's on page 560 of the book, Vatican, by, again, by Malachi Martin, insider and friend of Pope John the Twenty Third. In 1979, again, still in 1979, remember we talked at the beginning of the program about Augustino Casaroli being appointed as an emissary to Soviet Russia. John Paul now brings him back as the new Vatican Secretary of State. And the Vatican Secretary of State is in charge of all Vatican foreign policy. So now he's had that much time in building these bridges with Soviet Russia and now comes back as Secretary of State for the Vatican. So in 1980, a year later, when Lech Walesa, leader of the Solidarity Movement, is placed under house arrest for two years as the movement begins to get started because it's initially banned in Poland by the communist government. But as you pointed out earlier, a rising star is coming into Soviet Russia, the political scheme of Soviet Russia by the name of Mikhail Gorbachev. And in 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev becomes president of the Politburo and the leader of the Soviet Union. So between 1985 and 1989, then, there are many changes taking place in the Soviet Union, and as you also pointed out, that appeared to be positive toward the West in, term, in terms of considering democratic reforms. Right, because Gorbachev was actually considered to be the first real democratic uh, leader in the Soviet Union, and uh, because it always been under communism, and then we see that begin to falter with Boris Yeltsin, uh, after Gorbachev is uh, taken out of office. Right. And initially, some people have suspected that because of the economic situation in Russia, that they were that was actually a factor in influencing Gorbachev to consider some of these democratic reforms. And again, that's another discussion in terms of uh, the timeline. Once we get through the timeline, we can, we'll go back and re, you know redress some of these things. So it's in 1985 then that Pope John Paul II, remember, in the background is still interfaithism. There's still this inclusiveness. There's still this ecumenicalism. So in 1985, Pope John Paul makes the statement that Muslims and Christians worship the same God while visiting Morocco in August on an official state visit. Pope John Paul II, speaking to Muslims in Morocco, said, We believe in the same God, the one God, the living God. And of course, that new term, Chrislam, uh, that movement makes similar claims today. Now, this statement conflicts with the Christian beliefs, as Christians believe, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God and the manifestation of God. Uh, in the flesh here on earth, whereas the Muslims do not believe that Jesus Christ is the manifestation of God or God, nor that Christ is the Son of God. As a matter of fact, on the Dome of the Rock, inscribed on the dome, it says God has no son in Jerusalem. Also, Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for the remission of sins for all that will believe on his name, yet Muslims deny that Jesus died on a cross. So that statement is puzzling from Pope John Paul II, who became the first pope to visit a Muslim country at the invitation of a religious leader. So now we skip ahead another year, 1986, and we're, we're working up to 1989 when the, as we get toward the Berlin Wall coming down in that era. In 1986, John Paul II convened the World Day of Prayer in Assisi, Italy. And the participants included uh, not only the Christian denominations, but also pagan religions, Wiccans, Unitarians, uh, the gamut of religions around the world, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. 
and many others under the Basilica of St. Francis. Are you serious, Brother Gary? You're talking about not just the Christian religions, but they right. brought in Wiccans. Right. Uh, you know, I, we Remember. already see that they brought in the Muslims with uh, Pope Francis when he goes to the Vatican to have a prayer meeting with Shimon Perez, the Muslims, and of course the Vatican. Uh, I, I don't even call that a Christian meeting there. That's no. just nothing but paganism. But I had no idea that Pope John Paul II in 1986 was the first one. And what's kind of ironic is then we see uh, in America, we see the National Day of, Day of Prayer. It really began to get a momentum, and I'm assuming it was sprung off of this very event. Exactly. Um, interfaithism. We're going to see that uh, not only Barack Obama, but George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, believed in interfaithism. And remember the inclusiveness. Obama went so far as to have three different uh, religious leaders at his swearing-in pray for him just to make sure he covered all his bases, so to speak. Uh, we had, uh, of course, uh, Rick Warren. Uh, and we, we had a, a Muslim imam, I believe. And we had uh, perhaps a Jewish rabbi, if my memory strikes me correctly. He wanted to cover all his bases on uh, this inclusiveness. By, you know, by, and so he actually had three different uh, prayers on his swearing in. So all of this is aimed at uh, interfaith faithism. Uh, you know we're, and, and we'll see in a minute that there there's a, some key conferences now that are going to envelope in core beliefs that are sound good things that that people um, feel good about in terms of how we deal with each other, but aren't really biblically core oriented. We're going to see that. You know, Brother Gary, before before we continue on, let me just really <clears throat> stress something here with the, with, with the people that will be watching the video here. And that is, if you have watched, if you have followed from the beginning of this video, and whether we do this as one solid video or whether I break it into two parts, notice every step of the way this has been orchestrated. Right, it's been orchestrated, and they're breaking down these objections step by step right every every political every religious figure there is but in every case it is initiated by the vatican and they are they have put in place uh, laws through the united nations to try to help enforce this the vatican's hand is on every single step every page every rule every dialogue involved in this and that's what's kind of ironic brother gary because so much I keep hearing people when they, when they point to the Mahdi, uh, the Muslim Antichrist based on Muslim writings and stuff uh, with their own little eschatology there. And yet I've said to them over and over and over and over, you know, we look, for example, I believe it's in um, uh, Ezekiel's prophecy where God says that they, they, will not go longer, they will no longer go in and out from thee. Talking about the world dignitaries when he gets ready to destroy Adam, uh, he said they won't be coming in and out any longer. And, and it's like all the world leaders, whether it's religious or political, all go to Rome. They everyone go to Rome and bow down to the Pope. And, and now we're seeing this whole thing, this whole uniting of one faith, one religion, one system of government in the world has been the Vatican from day one. And I think this is why your research is, to me, Brother Gary, it's, 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 it's invaluable for us to see this because the people are, are duped in the idea. I, I find, Brother Gary, what I find that happens, on, especially in YouTube, when people bounce from one thought to another thought to another ideology, another teacher, this teacher, that teacher, they're not keeping with a sound doctrine that stays right with the Word of God. And so whatever the excitement is for that moment, that's what they jump onto. That's the bandwagon that people want to ride. They're not looking at exactly what's happened throughout history. And that's what we're trying to bring out. I was amazed myself. When you start laying out, even in a short period of time, the decisions that are made chronologically, and that's why I wanted to set it down to paper, 
and you start looking at not just one decision here, one decision there, but you start looking at the list and, and you just can't ignore it anymore. Where, um, and that's where it's, it, you know, we need to be wise and uh, wise in the word. When we get to 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev writes a book. It's called Perestroika. Some of you may have heard of it. And this is very telling because he writes, this is Mr. Gorbachev, writing that there are three main causes of war in the world. There have been three main causes. Uh, number one, political conflicts. Number two, religious conflicts. And number three, economic conflicts. And so Gorbachev proposes three solutions to eliminate wars by dealing with these three issues political, religious, and economic. He proposes one, a one world government. Where have we heard that before? We just heard that referred to by a, a, a previous pope we talked about. He proposes a global religious system. Now isn't that interesting? You've got a Soviet leader proposing a global religious system. And of course, a global economy. That's number three. You know, he's proposing exactly what the Bible prophesies would happen as we come to the end of the age. Yes. And he's actually, now this right here, Brother Gary, this shows me that what I was told before, that Gorbachev was brought in, there was a bishop that was behind him getting into power, and that he was actually a Jesuit to start with. And in fact, um, when you look at Barry Chalmers' book, uh, uh, Saving Israel, he mm -hmm. goes into the to the side of the Jesuits and how they have controlled the politics all the way down through. How every leader practically that there is in the world has been a Jesuit to start with or Jesuit controlled. Uh, and the ones that have not been have been killed in the process. In fact, this is one of the um, one of the theories on the assassination of John F. Kennedy that although he was Catholic, he refused to obey the Pope's command. And they said that's what got him assassinated. His brother also was like-minded. He was very independent, refused to go with the Catholic Church and their demands, so they killed him as well. Uh, Teddy Kennedy, however, he got a little smarter and decided he wasn't going to die at the hands of this, so he wasn't going to run for that office, that office, but he would obey whatever the Vatican wanted him to do. And, uh, and interestingly enough, a little off-topic, but still in the same realm, the last election we had, when we had uh, two candidates in particular, I, gosh, I forget their names and they're right on the top of my head, tip of my tongue that is, um, and one of them I believe is on Fox News now, uh, with his own program there, that were candidates for president. Both of those were Catholic. The one young man that actually really began, and Gary, you may remember their names, that uh, began, gained a lot of momentum right there against Obama at the very end, but then fell off. Both of them are Catholics. Both of them were constantly stating they have to go back and see what the Pope has to say. One of them in particular, and he's a, he's a heavy set guy. Oh, Mike Huckabee? Is that who you're thinking? Not Mike Huckabee. Not Mike Huckabee. It was, um, they were running for president, but they, they didn't get, they didn't make it to the runoff. They were running against, um, actually, when the subject of abortion came up, late term abortion, he stated, uh, I can't. I need to see what the Pope's opinion is on this That's before I can make a statement. Yeah. This was on national television. Yeah. Uh, Bill Clinton's wife, Hillary, run. She's got a good chance of getting it. Uh, I would rather see Michelle Bachman if it's going to be a woman though than yeah, uh, Hillary absolutely. Clinton. So at least we know Michelle Bachman will stand by Israel. Hillary won't. Right. But I'm afraid Hillary would. If she runs, she might have, she's got a very good chance of getting it. Because they're not going to let, uh, I don't know though, you know, you look at Obama's running mate, uh, I mean his, uh, the vice president, and he's got a chance. Joe the Gaff. Yeah. Joe Biden, he's a good, he's another Catholic. And, uh, right. But you know, they always say that the vice president is the true president and the other guy's only the figurehead. Really? Yeah, I've heard that said many times. Anyway, so where do we leave off? No, we're Mikhail Gorbachev in his book Perestroika in eliminating war. He proposed a one world government, again, a 
global religious system and a global economy, but he goes further. And he proposes to eliminate religious conflicts by advocating and adopting a one-world religious system and the birth of a new world order. So now we're hearing that term from him and interesting from a political leader from Russia of all places, we're hearing the, that he's advocating a global religious system, a one world religious system. And that just confirms though that if it is true that, that all the political leaders in the world today are put there by the Catholic Church, um, it's like, for example, Gary, Michael Bialski, Tuvia Bialski's son, the famous movie uh, Defiance, where Ed Zwick uh, directed this film uh, that shows the deliverance of the children of Israel from Belarusia. His own son told me that in 1948, when the War of Independence was about to start, his father was asked to, to come and to fight because of his fight in, in Belarusia against the Germans. And but there were certain families that were vying for power in Israel then. Wow. And he was instructed to kill anybody that came past the checkpoint that he was uh, commanded to guard over, Jews included. And later, some of those families that came into power were the Perez family uh, that fought in that battle of independence. And this, so it really had nothing to do with Israel gaining independence. This was the Vatican's move in order to gain power uh, with certain individual families there in Israel so that they would be able to control the country later down the road. Now, Shimon Peres was uh, educated at a Jesuit university in Poland. Hmm, interesting. And so no wonder why he has a, a connection with the Pope. And a, you know, It's kind of like Abbas. Abbas, again, another Jesuit that's placed in there. Uh, I used to kind of think, because I had a, a, a person write me one time, and they said, Steve, don't pontificate the entire Bible. But we're sitting here looking at the historical facts that you have outlined for us, Gary, and, and the, the whole world is being pontificated. Yeah, and Mikhail Gorbachev goes further in his call, in his book, and now we begin to see how the purpose of aligning or using religion, I'm going to use that term loosely, the term religion, uh, to fit their purpose, the agenda. Mikhail Gorbachev calls for, quote, killing off all genocide, apartheid, and religious exclusiveness. Remember that in order to achieve this one world religious system, we talked about what genocide is and how the genocide treaty, it means more than just physical harm. Uh, the U.S. now is a signatory to genocide. It could be words that you speak could be considered genocide. So he's advocating against genocide, apartheid. We hear that term, don't we, on the news with Israel. Oh, Israel's practicing apartheid. I don't think so. I know they're not practicing apartheid. It's a catchphrase. It means something in totally different from what they're using. But they're lining up legally, according to the United Nations, a reason to go take action, to justify their actions, to make sure that a certain outcome occurs. So here we are in 1987 where Makar Gorbachev is calling for, not, for a global religious system as well as a global political system and economic system, but he's laying it out. He's also going further, calling for the killing off of all genocide, apartheid, and religious exclusiveness. Well, what's the opposite of exclusive? Inclusing, inclusiveness or interfaithism, which we've been talking about. Meeting that small... Uh, agreement of core beliefs at the expense of your, your doctrine beliefs. Now, Gary, let me ask you this. So <clears throat> is he also advocating that those that do not go along with this type of New World Order, that they're to basically to be 
uh, done away with? Is that what he's advocating? Yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like it from the language. Listen to his next quote. That was from page 231 of his book, by the way, what I read there. Quote, we must extirpate all genocide, apartheid, and religious exclusiveness. We've got to do that. So he's laying the foundation for the UN to mandate that there will be consequences if you don't fall into line with what they're going to decide to do. Could this be where Sharia law comes into play then? You know, this is what's kind of interesting. They're talking about governments that are enacting what they call Sharia law, the, 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 the Muslim's way of execution, beheading for certain crimes, different things. What I find interesting, though, Brother Gary, is that when we go back and we look in the history of the Vatican, especially during the Dark Ages, and the methods of their capital punishment for not going along with the the rule of religion, as well as, of course, we know as you know the Pope's flag with the two keys on it, exercising both religious and political powers, uh, their methods of torture and putting to death are very much like what we call Sharia law today. Or is this just a, maybe a political game that they're blaming the Muslims? Uh, that this, in other words, we're, we're putting all the focus on the Muslim people by saying, okay, we're, we, they've enacted Sharia law. In Europe now, uh, the United States is looking at adopting Sharia law here, and, and everybody's minds are focused on, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, the Muslims are taking over the world. It, it really looks like when, when you when you look at this, brother Gary, that the Vatican is setting this all up, but they are the ones that are allowing what laws are going to be there, which are in line with the way of punishment they did, you know, hundreds of years ago.